Hi, and welcome to Jolt TV. I'm Tyler Martinola, Hillsborough County Film Commissioner. Today we're joined by Mike Compton, Executive Producer of Three Chairs Productions. And we're back. Thanks, Mike. Hey, no Appreciate problem. Appreciate you coming in, buddy. Thanks for having us. Uh, so I like to start all these things off with just some basic biographic uh, information. Um, you are a, uh, a Michigan native, if I'm mm. not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, how does a Michigander end up in uh, sunny Florida? You as well are a Michigan native. Also true. <laughs> uh, so you know very well <laughs> what it takes. Palm trees. Palm trees. Beaches. Uh, not gray skies every day. Right. Um, as of Michigan State University, uh, media production degree there. It's a telecom degree. Um, and then Mackinac Island after that. And then on the island, um, we're mostly hospitality, right? Mm -hmm. So we mostly follow the sun. And that's an easy thing for me to do. So me and a couple of guys got together, we got a car, and we just landed in Tampa. Yeah. And uh, from there... Did you just pick it out of a map? And it was it was Tampa, uh, Naples, and Key West were my areas where I knew some people that I could yeah. you know couch surf for a little bit and really kind of find another hospitality job and serve tables and do whatever it takes to make it happen. Uh, I just felt like Tampa, there was just so much growth. And this is 01 when I graduated. So that fall is when I came down. And <coughs> I just, I did, you know, beyond Bayshore, I landed in post Hyde Park. So, yeah. I mean, there was no turning back from that. I haven't left that six mile radius in 15 years. I don't know if that's cool or not. I don't think it is. But as when I was there on Bayshore, I, I, you could just, I was like, you know what? What if I just fell upon all this money? You know what I mean? Like, there's so much growth going on yeah. here that I was just like, I can either go back to the beach and go back to serving tables and that type of thing, or I could, you know, kind of make my way in a medium sized market versus going to an LA right. or New York and, and kind of, you know, hone my craft here. We're, we're going to get to, uh, to Three Chairs Productions here in a second and what you do sure. with that. But let's, let's talk about college hmm. for a little bit. Um, are you doing now what you thought you would be doing when you were going through your collegiate career? No. No. <laughs> but yes. Okay. We're still, still telling stories. Uh, I'm just telling stories for a different audience than I thought I was going to tell stories for, right? Because you're in college and you can go on Facebook, on my Facebook, and see my first movie uh, on my, on my, on my uh, page there, videos. And it was cool because um, I was able to kind of sneak my way into meetings mm. and I ended up getting this great opportunity um, because I, w I did go to a meeting and I got the person's contact information and that person, it was Red Bull. And so I was able to uh, kind of reach out and just keep on her base, uh, on her radar so that, you know, a month goes by and I'm like, I haven't heard from this lady yet. And I know they're looking for students to produce a film festival. I'm like, oh, I want to do that. I'm not supposed to be in this meeting, so I'm going to shut up right now, but I'm, I'm, I want to do that. So I'm, I'm emailing her, and she's like, where were you at this meeting? Well, again, I wasn't supposed to be in the first meeting, so I wasn't in the second meeting. Yeah. So she's like, here, come up to, I think it was Boyne Highlands or something like that. We're doing a ski weekend, and can you shoot you know, an overview video of that? And I'm like, sure, I need to bring a friend. She's like, yeah, no problem. So flew up there, did the video, ended up getting the job to produce some film festival. It was called Lawn Shorts. And... Uh, this is bringing me back. So this is my junior year um, in Michigan State. And, and from then, it was like, yes, I'm, this is what I can do. I, I'm doing it now in college, and, and I want to do this for the rest of my life. Uh, I was also able to kind of, under an alias, get my script approved to be you know, shot through mm -hmm. the film festival, too. And Red Bull was paying for everything. And so um, not only did I produce the film festival, which had six other students in it, 
um, managing them, I was also able to produce my own film that was at the, you know, premiered in the in the Lawn Shorts Film Festival as well. Uh, so that was my first kind of taste yeah. of doing it, and I'm like, oh, shoot, I can't go back from this. Uh, <laughs> so I ended up just keeping the eye on the prize, hustling, bartending, serving tables, parking cars, um, and just kind of build a production company, fail the production company. Right. My first production company was Big Kahuna Presents. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I knew you back then, No, <laughs> but some guys that watch us, they, they remember Big Kahuna Presents, and we were just a couple of dudes, four dudes, just kind of figuring it out. Yeah. I think we made two grand in two years, right? Dissolved. You know, say, so, hey guys, thanks a bunch. I'm going to go back up to Mackinac. I'm going to go work. I'm going to go make some more money, save it, and I came back yeah. down, and, and the rest is history. So what was your, your first big leap into the film world that was successful that you were able to to say, all right, I'm not going to have to wait tables anymore. Like I can actually pay my bills. I can be a professional at this. Sure, sure. That all happened in 07. Uh, I was working with the Guzos for a few years before that, and we were producing shorts and kind of, you know, starting our advertising career mm -hmm. where we're just like finding agencies and that type of thing in the corporate level as well. And then um, we had an opportunity to uh, join Tampa Digital Studios. And so I'm, I'm an alumni of many of us here in the market from Tampa Digital Studios. Yeah. And at that point, it was like, yes, okay. So I was there for three years. I got to meet everybody you can possibly meet. You know, I'm a networker, so I did the breakfast, lunch, dinner, let, to the point where the boss was like, stop. Yeah. Stop networking. Just do something else. I'm like, no, but okay. Um, so we were just producing. Producing nonprofits, producing uh, corporate, you know, films, producing... Uh, live entertainment, we did some sports for rugby, we did all kinds of stuff at Tampa Digital. Uh, we, it was a great group of people and yeah. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from a few, uh, a few, a few of my competitors I have today um, that are still in the market, that are thriving too. Like all of us alumni kind of keep together and like, yeah. you know, talk and kind of you know, get together every few years, you know, everybody's on each other's radar and uh, it's a cool community to be a part of. So. You know, going back to like your, your collegiate career, I think most people who want to get into film, they want to be a big time director, they want to be a cinematographer. It's usually one of those two things, maybe a writer. Mm -hmm. um, for as long as I've known you, you've always seemed to have gravitated more towards the producing and production logistics side of things. Mm -hmm. um, was that something you knew early on that that's what you wanted to do, or you mm -hmm. just found, like, I'm really good at this? Mm -mm. No, thanks to, um, what's the movie? Uh, you gotta get to pitch me something here. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. right? Shoot, thanks to um, uh, swingers. Swingers, okay. When he picks up the girls at the casino and says, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a producer," and they go, right. "Oh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be that, that guy. You know, I wanted to be Vince Vaughn and, and swingers." And, and, and Even though I don't it. think Vince Vaughn knew what nope. that meant, mm -hmm. but it still it still worked out. I still for know that, what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good question. We'll ask you what, what you actually do as far as the producing and production logistics. Yeah. Um, are you happy in that position, though? Do you find it still rewarding and creative? 100%. Because as a producer, you kind of have to know every little bit yeah. of your production. Um, and you do, depending on what kind of producer you are. You're, you can be a creative producer and be really hands-on in the creative. You can be a line producer where you're more logistics and numbers. You can be an executive producer like I am now where I'm you know kind of in charge of the money mm -hmm. and kind of say, hey, uh, some people call me a dream killer now where, you know, like, right? I mean, the creatives come up with these great ideas yeah. and you're like, I have this much money, come up with another good idea. And they do. And, and so, so, you know, I kind of like being a part of a little bit of everything, right. you know, jack of all trades. So uh, as one of the, uh, the alumni of, of Tampa Digital, mm -hmm. and I think if you look at most of the top production companies here in town, all of them have someone from Tampa Digital who is either at the heart mm -hmm. of that production company mm -hmm. or they they work with them closely. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come up with the concept for for Three Chairs Productions, and how did you pull that that sort of synergistic team of people around you? Right, so I, I learned a lot from Tampa Digital and the group that was there at Tampa Digital. Just enormous amount of knowledge and just honed my craft and again met everybody I needed to know. So when I had to leave. Tampa Digital for budget constraints mm -hmm. as, as it was uh, in 07, right? Um, I had to start on my own. And uh, there was no turning back. I mean, what am I, I going to sell mortgages again? Because yeah. I did that at one point. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, you know, 
keep working and, and keep the eye on the prize. So Compton Multimedia came into play and I had a couple of clients there and I still have those clients today from, from back then. And, and then uh, the American Advertising Federation, I was always big into Ad to Tampa Bay because um, I was well, 32 and under back then and then I graduated from 32 and above, you know, and so they kicked me out and they gave me a trophy and said, you gotta go. Um, so then I joined AAF and when I joined AAF, I circled back with my relationship with uh, my, my partner now, George right. Zwerko. AAF being American Advertising Federation. Oh, I did an acronym you told me not right. to. <laughs> my bad. Uh, the American Advertising Federation in Tampa Bay. So at that point, um, joined the education committee there and developed a more relationship with George and we talked and he had an agency called Roombo and he wanted to start production arm. And so we're like, we don't want to be that, that agency that has the production inside. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to play nicely in the sandbox with everybody, you know. Uh, we want to be able to take different projects and, and own our own projects and not just have to stick with, you know, Roomba projects or, or set agency projects. So we started uh, Three Chairs Productions. Um, <laughs> true story is uh, George looked into the other room. He's the creative, right? He's the creative director. He's, he saw Three Chairs and wrote it down. So we come in, I come in, you know, we talk about it. What are we going to name this? What are we going to name this company? And, you know, it goes through a list of names. I'm like, ah, I'm like well, three chairs. Let's, let's circle back with that. Yeah. And then, you know, from there, we're like, you know, it could be it, maybe this. It would be creative is a chair, production is a chair, and client as a chair. So we're all sitting at the table having a conversation about how we're going to make great products and great content for said client. Yeah. So there's three chairs production. I've done it for a long time. I had no idea about that story. Yeah. George is going to kill me because I'm telling the truth. I can't lie. I can't make sure. It's actually a good. It's it's a good story though, and, and it makes sense now how you, you position those three chairs and the three roles. Um, so obviously you had clients coming from your own previous company, but also people and networking connections you made with Tampa Digital. Mm -hmm. Once you sort of coalesced and you created three chairs productions, what was it like going after those first new clients as the new kid on the block? Was it was it difficult? How did you position yourself to be different from any other production company in town? We're bringing that creative piece to the table. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a George on our team, which means we have 20 plus years, I'm not gonna date the guy, but you know, a good amount of years yeah. on the, the advertising agency side. If you, if you were to put George in any market as a creative director, he would thrive. Uh, he's just that talented. So we have that. And so now, <laughs> for, unfortunately for him, we're kind of leaning on, hey, can you come up with this creative idea for the small budget that we have here? Because we need it. Right. Because we need the project. And so, hey, can you also mock up storyboards? He's an excellent artist as well. So he creates storyboards and, you know, I make it work within the budget. And that's kind of how we positioned ourselves. It was more of a, a video marketing company mm -hmm. versus just a video content. Hey, define for me what you mean by video marketing. Like what, what, what is for that us, to you? Uh, we like to build these relationships that are just ongoing relationships. Like I mentioned, I still have clients from back when I was mm -hmm. Compton Multimedia. We really do build those relationships in every way. So for us, when we say cut, it doesn't stop from there. Right. We also, uh, well, who's going to watch your video? You know, how are they going to get to it? What are the deliverables? Um, how is it working? Let's let's track it. Let's analyze what's working and what's not working. And then the next script, let's change it, and let's just kind of hone in on what who our, what our audience wants to hear, and let's track it. Are they going to the website? Are they converting? Um, are they not? Are they they're leaving at 20 seconds of the video and they're just going to ESPN, right. you know what I mean? Like, what are they doing, where are they going, and why? And if they're not doing what it is our video wanted to do, because what's the point of making the said video if they're not, if you're not getting anything from it? Uh, let's change it up next time, let's try right. something else. Because if we're looking at the data and the analytics. So do, do you have someone on your team that just does the analytics, or is that something you've acquired the knowledge of over the years? So what we have are sister companies. We're, we're kind of, covered the arena, if you will. So, right, we have three chairs and we have Roombo, mm -hmm. right? Those are the low-hanging fruit. Now we also have a group called iPopper. And iPopper is the, the media, right? So they place all of our media for us and then they analyze everything and they have all the analytics and software that we need to go ahead and, and make it work. Right. Um, so I will say this just to, to, to give a compliment to your, your company. Um, Tampa Bay is, is a huge commercial market, uh, both for you know, product commercials, but also direct, direct response, um, uh, video marketing. There's so many different companies. And I, I feel like 
It doesn't just take place in Tampa. It takes place in a lot of markets where production companies were sort of silo themselves off creatively. They don't play nice in the same sandbox. Mm -hmm. I understand that to a certain extent because you're all sort of bidding on the same project sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but three chairs in particular, and uh, we did have um, custom built with Pete Guzzo mm -hmm. in a, a previous episode. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you guys- You worked with Joe Davison? Uh, constantly, and Joe Davison was on a, a previous uh, episode as well. Uh -huh. uh, you guys seem to you know, not care about walls or, or property lines, uh, if I can use that analogy. You know, you, you really seem to just try to find the most creative puzzle piece that works for whatever production you are. Um, what is it like building those relationships and how do you walk that fine line of still playing nice with everybody but still having to bid against them? Sure, transparency is, is crucial. I mean, just transparency and uh, checking your ego mm -hmm. at the door. Uh, you know me for a little bit, my ego is there, but it's, I mean, I come on, you yeah. know, like, we're doing videos here. We're, 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 we're creating stories, which is we're having fun. Yeah. We just want to build on our craft. We just want to have fun and and really make great stories for whatever company it is. So, you know, Pete and I share the same space, Lot 1901. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually four production companies in Lot 1901, to be honest. Um, so, so we just are transparent. You know, hey, are you bidding on this? No, cool, we are. Or maybe we'll call Diamond View and say, hey, are you guys bidding on this? No. Okay, great. We are. Or you know, you are. All right. Maybe we'll back out. All, right. you know, all the players, like you know, I can reach out to the company man. Any, anybody we want to reach out to, we can say, hey, are you guys bidding on this? And if they say yeah, well, <laughs> we may or may not back out. But at least we know, right? right. At least we, we we know we're you know, and the best man wins. You know, so you check your ego at the door. You be transparent. You be honest about it because you want to be treated right and you want to treat your people right, no matter right. if there's competitors or customers. Like you just want to do the right thing every time. And that's what we try to do. I think I do that to a fault a little too much, um, but it's been working for us and we like, I like that. What, what is your approach when you're, you're going after a new client? Um, not necessarily what makes you unique, but, but how do you approach the bidding process? Like what are some of the things that you internalize and that are unique to you, but also just sort of good housekeeping rules for anyone bidding on a job that they should probably follow? So. We have a, a, a list of questions, and they're, they're marketing-heavy questions, but you need to know these to tell the story mm -hmm. and to really drive the story and hit home with your audience. So we have a list of questions that we walk all of our clients through. So we know what it is that we need to do and how to do it. And they answer those questions, or they don't. You know, so w when they typically do answer the questions, we have a better time bidding, right, because we hone in on what we need to do you know, and we have a creative idea from those marketing mm -hmm. questions, we can come up with a great idea, we can pitch the idea, and we already know what's gonna cost to make that idea happen. Um, if we're too low or too high, we can talk. Right. Again, sit down, have that conversation. What's your budget? We can do these deliverables now, and maybe these deliverables later. You know, um, it, it doesn't all have to happen at once. You know, and, and I think by being transparent and open and having this conversation with, the, with any, potential client, uh, I think that gives us you know, a better light. I think yeah. it shows that we care a little bit more. And that's pretty much why we have had the same clients for the past three or four or five years now. Sure. Uh, you know, and I, I've, I've talked to a lot of different production companies. Um, you know, you certainly have to keep the lights on at the end of the day. But mm -hmm. I also think there's something to be said about working with partners that, you know, you're simpatico with, that your vision creatively works with what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. They're good people, you're good people, everything mm -hmm. seems to work out. Mm -hmm. um, if you were giving advice to someone who's breaking into this industry, maybe a young student who just started their first production company, should they take every job or should they be more mindful about building better relationships early on or do you just have to keep the lights on at some point? Well, I mean, it, it's, it depends on where this person is, right? Do they have kids, do they have a wife, do right. they have a husband, do they have a family? Um, crucial part right there. <laughs> Uh, so, so that and, and are they willing to put in the work? Um, so it's a small budget, but you got to keep that standard quality. You yeah. need to have quality work. What do you, how are you going to sell that project to somebody else? You know, how are you going to show off your work if you don't have good work? Right. And and, and it'll grow. And it, you you'll you'll knock down those those small budget things, and you'll do good work. And then those budgets will get bigger and bigger and bigger as you keep your eye on the prize and as you develop your your craft. Yeah. Um, not asking you how much you price things out. Obviously, it's, it's different for every every production. Uh -huh. But would you 
advise, uh, again, uh, same situation mm -hmm. where it's a young filmmaker starting their production company, having sort of, even if it's on a sliding scale, standard rates and never deviating from those rates? You gotta deviate every now and again. That's where the negotiation is. But you gotta keep it as close to standard as possible. You yeah. have to pay your team. And if you're working with the pros, they have a certain standard rate. Each person, right. each grip, gaffer, the whole deal. Uh, DPs will fluctuate, right? Um, you know, but you got to keep them happy. And if, if you can't get to standard, be open about it. So this is a nonprofit. This is my first time. Help me out. People, it's so funny what people will do if you ask them. Yeah. And it's, it's just a simple ask. And if they say no, they say no, you move on to the next one. But if you ask said DP that is worth three grand a day, do you got 1200 can I, can I give you 1200 for this day? And this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to be doing. And this is all laid out right here. And they'll be, you know, if they have nothing going on, more than likely they'll take the project with yeah. you. How important is, when you're working with a client, how often, let me rephrase this, how often are they giving you, in your particular situation, the, the creative script and then you're implementing it? And how often is it you guys coming up with the creative comp, or, uh, concept and then trying to sell it to them? Yeah, it's, it's, it varies. It's like a 50-50. It's a coin yeah. toss per client. Um, if you're dealing with, you know, let's see, we deal with a bank. Uh, so said bank has a marketing team, and they have this marketing brief, and this is what they want. They're going to lean on us to make it work for video because we're those professionals. Mm -hmm. We're the video professionals. So we, they, want it, they want our input to tell the story the right, right. way. Uh, so we'll go back and forth with the conversation on that. If it's an agency, Agencies tend to really have their idea and like their idea, you know, and, and we'll go ahead and, and push back if, you know, and give our input, but they might just shoot it down right away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we did the right thing by pushing back, by giving our input and trying to make it better in our own eyes if they take the advice yeah. or if not. Uh, and this might be a 50-50 answer as well, but what do you find more rewarding, being able to implement someone else's idea or being able to create your own concept and birth it? Check in the bank. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> That's totally fair too. <laughs> Gotta keep the lights on somehow. So yeah. Um, no, no, no. Uh, I love to have a happy client. No matter how that client, what it takes to make yeah. that client happy, um, and if they stay partners with me or us, and and throughout the years, that's what makes me warm at heart. Um, uh, for example, the, the, the said bank client's been with us for four years, and then they're not not gonna, you know, we, they won't go anywhere because yeah. we're delivering, we're working hard for them and they know that. Um, all of our clients are kind of like that where, where we'll do our best and we'll push back on story and we'll give them input but if, if they don't like, you know, they want to go one way, yeah. we'll go, we'll walk down that road with you. So, uh, going back to your, your college career and making that first movie or that first short for, for Red Bull, yeah. obviously more narrative. I can give it to you too. I'll look that up actually yeah. when we finish this but. Uh, it's called The Space Between. And it's on your Facebook. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll plug that at the oh end. Yeah. Um, so you're coming from a narrative background, mm -hmm. and you're still telling a story when it comes to selling a product or educating someone. Mm -hmm. um, are there any key differences, though, if you were to, to give advice to, again, like a college student or a high school student coming out who's been completely narratively focused? How do they shift their mindset and move more towards product? I would take some classes. I would, I would take some ad advertising classes, some marketing classes. Um, and then I would look for uh, another production company to learn from. Um, we pride ourselves on developing entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, we're able to have such long staying in the market and, and being able to be around so long and, and make quality work is because we work with pros and people who care um, because they're all entrepreneurs. Right. Three chairs is George and myself. Everybody else is contract workers, but we've worked with the same people for four plus years. Um, and and we, some of them had started clean slate with us and just developed and grew and built their own business, uh, whether they're a DP or an audio, you know, engineer or whatever, you, you know, may be. They now they have their own clients and now they're thriving. Right. You know, I barely see some of my team now um, because they're constantly traveling and doing their thing. Um, and then there's other people out there that we can call on to. There are pros that know that we can do the right thing, but we try our best to keep our team together. Yeah. So going off that, that sort of entrepreneurial drive, um, let's let's talk about uh, your space, Lot 1901 for a second, sure. which is 
really one of the only like collaborative studio spaces I can think of, at least in like a 30 or 40 mile radius mm -hmm. around here. Mm -hmm. um, how did that idea come up? Um, how do you use that space? So, um, honestly the idea came from me knowing what not to do from a previous employer, right? So I'm like, I don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to act like that. I'm like, I want to be able to work with anybody and I want everybody to be comfortable and work with me. Um, so with that said, um, we were based out of the Rialto Theater uh, for a hot minute when, when there was no toilet in the Rialto Theater. And uh, they were doing all the renovations and they had this little co-work space. And co this is kind of the new, like co-working was just kind of coming to mm -hmm. play. I'm like, well, we can do that. Let's do it here. Well. You know, the Rialto is beautiful and they have their own thing going on, their event space. They, yeah. they, you know, so all of a sudden, uh, Cuso sent us, uh, you know, I said, hey, I think that this place has opened up. I'm, you know, he, was, he wasn't in a place at the time where he could really jump on the space. So we did, and it's, uh, it, was, it was the old uh, Seaboard Cafeteria turned Carmine's turned to an uh, interior design company. Um, and it was been vacant for three years, and it's just wide open space. We're like, we can do this. We can turn the space into a collaborative co-work space, if you will, and, and you know, have a monthly, you know, uh, rental fee to said production company or producer or editor or whatever you want to do that's in the video production space. And you can have it here. And then, then now they don't have to work from home. Right now they can come in here and, and, and work out of one of our stations that we have at, at, at the space. And, uh, and then let's build a white site over here so we can have photographers come in and, and shoot those generic commercials or right. whatever videos or product shots or whatever it is you, you need a white you need a white site don't you so we built one of those from a YouTube video you know our contractor had no idea what we were talking about and we're just like here watch this build it and he did and it's still <laughs> working it's made of wood uh, whatever um, but uh, so we have all the elements there we you know we've got our edit bays we've got uh, some workstations and we've got the psych and we've got a green room um, and then, so it's it's wide open. The people who rent from us on a monthly basis get a, you know, half off their rental fee. You know, whatever it is. If it's 150 an hour, there you go for 75 yeah. an hour type of situation. Uh, people who are outside the the subscription base, they the monthly rental. They can come in and rent the space, and we just have to be like, hey, you know, space is being rented right now. Go to Blind Tiger or the Bricks or right. wherever you need to go to to work for the day. Um, so we're. We kind of took that model, that co-work model, and just made it for video production yeah. people. So um, obviously, the, the name of this TV show is Jolt TV. Uh -huh. um, but that that came about. We're going to get to your shirt in a sec yeah. here. Uh -huh. But that came about um, from a collaboration that the Film Commission was supporting with Jolt Production School. Mm -hmm. um, and Jolt Production School lets you explain what it is. But uh, it took that sort of collaborative. Um, entrepreneurial idea of I think what Lot 1901, what Three Chairs was about, and really translated that into a, a mm -hmm. community service where you're you're really helping um, kids out. So why don't you explain a little bit about how Jolt Production came about, mm -hmm. um, and then sort of what you guys have done with that. So you know, in the collaborative nature, uh, Jolt was founded by two other production companies, Custom Built and now Contender. So Pete and Chance. Uh, had this idea. I think it was Pete's original idea. I think Chance loved it. And I think that you know they they were looking for a producer, and, and here I am. I'm, I, I love the idea, so I'm like, yeah, I'm on board. So the three of us got together, and we um, our first one was a few years ago. I think it was 2003. I don't know. It was a few years ago, and we had about 15 students, and we did a month of weekends, and it was 12 hour days, and we our idea is to bring up entrepreneurs and and really uh, teach them the craft and let them, let them kind of figure out where they want to be in life as far as in the video production sphere. And then also create content for nonprofits. So we ended up doing um, two, no two PSAs for Tampa Theater and two PSAs for Instruments of Change. And you know, so the director would be, you know, obviously the director at one point, the student director would be, you know, directing his scene and then it would flip. And then the next, you know, he would be a PA for the next PSA, mm -hmm. you know, so they would know above the line, below the line efforts on, on what it takes to produce uh, a PSA for that right. one. Um, we ended up bringing in great talent like Joe Davison, like Curtis Graham, like um, George Fuller, you know, writers. We had PPK, 
uh, help write the spots and um, we had the students pitch to us what they wanted to be, if they wanted to be a director, producer, writer, whatever they wanted to be. And we chose them and they did the work. They had to right. pitch the, to the client. I mean, so we're putting these, not just kids, right? I mean, they're all ages. They're high school, college, and beyond. Putting them in front of real clients, pitching them, telling them this is how we're going to do it, this is how we're going to execute it. So we're putting them in real life situations. So hopefully they can build from that. And then they get to leave with a reel. Right. So, you know, that's great. Uh, but the issue with that is we're all professionals trying to build our jobs, right? We're trying to build our companies. So we kind of took a hiatus and now we're starting to bring it back up, you know, and we had a couple this year um, camps. Um, we've done a couple camps with uh, Gasparilla Film Festival and Gasparilla International Film Festival. And we would uh, we'd take a day and a weekend to talk to high school students, you know. So um, that was cool. So we kept kind of that pace. And then we recently just finished up doing Visit Tampa Bay's social media spots. Right. Um, so we started Joel, we did Joel, and, and we, we still love Joel. We love the idea of Joel. We love bringing up entrepreneurs. We love um, these young adults have so much energy and so much thrive, you know. Right. Um, they have so many questions and they want to do, do, and they just want to do, do, do. Well, this is how you do it. This is what you do. This is the steps you take. This is, you stay in your lane here. And don't talk to your director like that again, please. You know, that type of stuff, right. you know, and, and really kind of, and then they get to go away from the episode or from the from the camp with, uh, with a reel. Let's talk about why that's an important um, community. experience to have. Well, yeah. community, but yeah. also just the experience. I think you would agree, I hope at least, that what you learn in college is great. Mm -hmm. It can give you a lot of foundational elements, mm -hmm. but you will potentially learn more on a single commercial shoot or a single production mm -hmm. as far as just hands-on practicality mm -hmm. over a weekend or a week or a month, however long the production is, than you possibly learned in your entire four years in college. And, and we go to s colleges and we go to universities and we go to high schools and we talk about just that. We're not trying to take, we're not taking over universities. We're not trying, we're, we're supplementing them, right? We're, we're just giving them real world experience. And the professors, they all know that they need this real world experience. And so that's where we kind of niche and right. fit in into the world. So let's, uh, let's talk about um, another element of Three Chairs, which is Three Chairs Light. Sure. Um, how are you trying to sort of reinvent the landscape and market to the community now? Some of the mom and pop shops, mm -hmm. you know, your, your locals who might not be able to move in aggressively into video marketing the mm -hmm. way a bank would. How, sure. how are you making that viable for them? So we just launched this and, and we're still kind of developing it uh, as far as our marketing mm -hmm. collateral. We can't market ourselves for anything, right? Um, and, and what we're doing is for Three Chairs Light is more of subscription based and there's levels of subscriptions. You can go from like, I think it's like 75 up to 250 or something like that per month. You get a 15 second spot and you, you, you get, you know, whatever copy you want, call to action, logo, call to action, simple motion graphics type of stuff, one scene, one story, and you're in and you're out. Yeah. Um, a lot of companies, uh, you know, don't have the time, don't have the money, of the resources to spend 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand a pop for videos, um, we're trying to make this accessible to the masses uh, because we care. We care about the content. We care about people wanting to market. And then, hey, guess what? They're going to grow from there. Where are they going to grow? Who are they going to call when they do grow and have a budget? They're going to call us. Right. So, so we want to help. We want to help from the very, very, very beginning. Um, and, and this is our way of doing it. So. I'm always amazed at how few local mom and pop companies um, have a online presence, whether that's through social media, certainly very few of them have video collateral. Why is it important to engage in that space? And if you were pitching me, let's say I owned a, a small little company here locally, why would I care or be interested in having a, a 15 second video a month? Like what's that going to do for my business? I'm trying to remember the saying, right? Like a picture is worth a thousand words, but then the video is worth a hundred thousand words or something like that. So video is that impactful. Video yeah. is going to tell your story and show your culture right from the get-go. Um, and that's most that's the most important thing. People, um, consumers today are looking for, they're looking for stories, looking for an experience, yeah. right? They're looking to be a part of something that they appreciate and want to be a part of something. They can find your gadget anywhere. 
but they want to like you, they want to like what they're buying. And that's, to me, what video can portray. And we've been really lucky to be in the video space. Like uh, yeah. back in 97, when I was like coming up with this idea of being a producer, we're not even anywhere near where we were, like as far as right. video-wise. Video, well, video is more accessible, and you look back ninety six, ninety five, whatever it was. And then the internet and right. the whole digital sphere. And, and media buys were so expensive; you didn't have those social media platforms mm -hmm. where you could not necessarily well, cheaply, but more effectively. Okay, yeah. We did have MySpace, we MySpace. Uh, which is making a comeback. I was told so by a couple no one years ago, I think it back, was. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I still have a MySpace page. Never Google me or yeah. or anybody. To tell you, Ken's truth. my friend. Is that uh, t Tim? Tim, Tim or Ken or no? I, was, I think it was Tom. It was Tom. 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 Sorry. Uh, you sorry only get that if you're a millennial and, and you you had a Facebook. I'm sorry. Uh, everyone has Facebook. first picture I saw. My wife was her eating a giant piece of pizza like this from her MySpace, MySpace page. page. Yeah. Oh God, embarrassing MySpace. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about um, the storytelling. Yeah. And how you approach storytelling when it's for a product. I mean, maybe we're selling this camera or it's a widget or something. Mm -hmm. um, how do you still engage an audience and tell a story even though at the heart of it you're just selling a product? But are you just selling the product though? Isn't there somebody, I don't know, isn't there somebody usually behind that product though? Isn't you there know. an inventor behind that product or a manufacturer or somebody that came up with the idea? Right. You know? or, or what if it's lifestyle that that product is giving us? You know, so there's always a spin in the story that we can, and that's the that's really the, what is the thing now. I mean, anybody can make a video nowadays, right? Anybody can do that and say hey, we're making videos and we're doing this and we're telling a story. Right. Well, what's your who's your who are you talking to? Who's what's your story really? Uh, wh wh who's your audience? Um, what's the feeling that they want to get behind you know your video? Uh, what's your call to action? What do you what do you want? Right. You can't just put a video out there and say buy me. You know, you can find the story behind it. So if it's just widget, whatever that is, who invented it? Like, who came up with it? Why? You know, right. let's let's learn let's learn a little bit about their story too. So, uh, talking about demographic, who am I telling the story to? Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at, you know, I'm imagining most of your video content you're putting out there is probably for a social media platform of some sort. A lot of social. Do you do you find that? Twitter users are different than Facebook users. Instagram users are different than so many deliverables else. nowadays. So many deliverables. Um, yes, everybody. Every, every social platform is different. Yeah. Um, we're cutting up sixty-second Instagram videos now because that's all Instagram relates to. Twitter is more of a what's happening now, quick type of thing. Right. Instagram is more really cool, pretty images and telling the story in sixty seconds. Facebook is more long form. You know, more, hey, this is what we're about. You can have a little bit of a longer time on, on Facebook. And then your website can tell your whole story. And so that's kind of how it works, I think. You right. know, um, I, I'm not the whiz at social right now. We have a group that kind of helps us out with that. Um, but we know that it's different deliverables, different needs, different wants, because the audiences are different. So let's. Uh we have some time now to just talk, swap some more stories, uh -oh. perhaps. How much time um, do we have? Good Lord. Uh, oh, only 19 minutes. Yeah. This will go fast. It does go. You it didn't lie to me. No, it goes very, very fast. Because um, <laughs> I imagine things, if you've never been on a commercial set before, oh boy. Uh, the pacing is so much quicker than it is. Better walk with purpose. On a, yes, yeah. uh, than, a, than a feature film, where even though there's still that, that energy and that, that um, that pressure, mm -hmm. you don't have that clock constantly ticking where I've got three production days to get whatever it is I'm doing done, mm -hmm. um, and nothing can go wrong typically. You just don't mm -hmm. have that, that latitude. So looking back over your, your entire career, perhaps something recent or something from a, a while ago, mm -hmm. um, what has been like that one hellish moment on a, a set that you think back and it's like, oh, we almost didn't get this done, or everything was just being held by a threat, or maybe it all just went to hell in front of you. Hell in a handbasket? Hell in a handbasket. I don't know if I had a hell in a handbasket or if I, if I had did, I threw that memory away. Um, well, well, for instance, um, you know, nonprofit budgets are, are what nonprofit budgets are. Sometimes they're 10 grand and less and you gotta fit in a day, but your story wants to be such that there's a two day production. Uh, well, the story we try to fit in a day didn't uh, pass the board's approval, yeah. if you will. Um, there were certain elements that they wanted that we, we, you know, 
we walk through the entire process with the marketing, right? But then there's always another level of approvals that have to be made, especially in a nonprofit world. So we're walking through, this is what we're doing, these are the boards, this is gonna be great. Um, delivered. <laughs> Came back, we don't see any print, we don't see this, we don't see that. It's just like, we need more of that. I'm like, well, wait, we just did, in it's a beautiful story, and we, they, they want more. And I get it, and that's fine, I understand that. Well, this is what it's gonna cost to have another day of production, and three days or whatever it's gonna take for post-production type of situation. Yeah. Um, and, and, and since we did walk them through the entire process, the marketing team, they were on our side, right? We're like, they're like, yeah, we know, we screwed up with you. you know, or, you know, screwed up themselves. And we'll take the right. blame with them, of course. Uh, and then we'll say, okay, this is the budget to do it. And then so, you know, they approve the budget. Do, do you, I don't know how much you disclose to a client, but um, going back to like transparency, yeah. do you find when, when someone engages with you for the first time for video, whatever it might be, uh -huh. that they grow, grossly underestimate the costs of things and just how much it costs to rent a lens yeah. or a camera. Yeah. Um, and is that a bit of a, an education and is it your job to sort mm -hmm. of educate them and say, no, this is this is what an actual production day 100%. costs. 100%. I go line item by line item. I'll, they'll know every line item, what the costs are um, per line item, per everything. And we'll have a conversation. I've had many of conversations with agencies or, or, or corporate companies, you know, saying, hey, why does this cost this much money? And do we need makeup? And do we need, you know, a, a second grip? And, and yeah. you know, well, every line item you take off is going to be a detriment to your production quality. And so, yes, you need these people to, A, to make our day, B, to make our beautiful piece. You know, we, we're going to need each team member to do that. Um, can I go back and see if, you know, in you know, line item 36 can work for a hundred dollars less I mean yeah I can do that and I'll fight for you client but this is what it pretty much costs and these are all standard rates yeah so what's the old saying you can have it fast quality and cheap pick two, pick two. Um, and I, I think that that one is 100% true mm -hmm. um, but when you're when you're budgeting for a commercial what's that one line item that always comes back to, to bite you something that consistently goes wrong, or if something is gonna go wrong, it's probably that line item. Is it? Is it really just mm -hmm. making your day, or is usually. there other increments that this sort of factor in? Usually, usually it's making your day. And it's, and a lot of the times it's making your DP happy as well. Yeah. <laughs> Need that AC. Need that AC, you gotta follow focus, man. What are you doing? You're on an easy rig, without an AC, you're gonna be, you know. Right. So so there's that, like, hey, why do we, need, like, you just need these people. You need everybody to be a pro at their job and so they can stay in their lane and focus. Um, set direction, set design. Good Lord. I don't, more times than not, we don't have a budget. We don't have the budget for set design, so we have to be somewhere. And then, so now I'm, you know, looking at the camera, making sure that everything is, you know, looking at the monitor, making sure everything is set, is set directed and everything, you know, continuity-wise yeah. is on, on par and all this and that and the other. Or, or, you know, if we're wearing too many hats, and that's where low budget stuff comes into play where you're going to lose something. Audio screwed up somehow. Why do you, why do you think audio screwed up? Well, because the PA was monitoring it. And right, and I was doing craft services at the same time I was holding the boom, you know. Exactly, exactly. So if you were to give <coughs> uh, advice staying on this like tragedy or comedy of errors, things that can go wrong, to someone who is, is budgeting <laughs> a commercial for the first time, um, what is uh, a line item or a, a creature comfort that you would absolutely recommend they have on every single set that's gonna gonna help out every time they do a shoot? Craft service. Craft services? Yeah. And why? Makeup, that's another one. Uh, why? You gotta have your team fed and happy. You can work them 12 hours if you really wanted to, if you talked about it beforehand, Right. Uh, but come all hour, hour 11 and everybody's grumpy and hungry, your DP and your, your grip and gaffers are going to be like, let's just get it done yeah. and let's just be done with it. No, yeah. I absolutely agree. Um, both craft services and catering are so important. People always underestimate that. Mm -hmm. I had a, I won't say who, but it was a very seasoned uh, uh, gaffer here in the, the Bay Area once told me very seriously that if it slides under the door, it's not a meal. 
sure. it was meaning pizza. I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the problem is, is that that's sort of the default. You always order pizza. Mm -hmm. But if you're in day four and you're on day four of pizza, yeah. like your your crew revolts. Like yeah, you're yeah. Done. you got to have money for food. you got to keep your people happy. Have a little wrap party, too. Yeah. You know? Um, build your team. Don't don't try to take advantage of anybody. Talk through it. If your budget's lower, talk to them about it and say why. Um, if uh, if you have the money, give them the money. Don't pocket it. You're like you're gonna get, you're gonna recoup your money. You know why? Because you made a quality product and it come back to you for more. Hopefully every month, yeah. every quarter, at least every year. If you deliver that standard quality um, product and story. Uh, It'll come back. So you, you created Joel Production School to, to help train people um, both altruistically, you want people to get the experience, but also selfishly because it's a good way to, to bring in new crew members. But yeah. um, if I'm in a community that maybe doesn't have a Joel Production School mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm interested in commercial filmmaking, and commercial filmmaking, let's be honest, is very cliquish sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, how do I actually break into the industry? How do I, if I was a, a nobody, I just graduated film school, how do I approach you, Mike Compton, and say, hire me, I'll willing to do anything. Like what? What's I the technique there? Guarantee you, if you reach out to the film commission of your city, you're gonna you're gonna find your way in. I, I appreciate the plug. I, no, it's it's true, right? And that's the first thing I do in the market. If I'm if I'm going into a different market, which we are, like Nashville and Charleston, Detroit, the first people I'm calling are the film commissions, and yeah. I have, and they've already connected dots. Uh, we went up to Tennessee State to talk to Media Day for Tennessee State University, and there was. 50 to 100 you know, students there, just all eager to want to help. And I've already gotten emails with resumes and saying, hey, you know, we want to be a part, we want to help. Like, whatever I can do just to get in the door. Yeah. And that's, you got to have that mentality, you got to have that eager to reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out uh, and, and talk about what you want to do and, and work and work hard. Right. And that's it, really. Keep your eye on the prize, just keep working. So, um, Commercials are a little different than feature films, but have you ever considered joining one of the unions? Is union um, a designation as a, is it a detriment or is it something that's actually worthwhile to go into in the state of Florida, in your opinion? <laughs> uh, I don't have an opinion on the unions, to okay. be honest with you, because it's a right to work state right. in Florida, so we don't really deal with the unions. and. Our uh, our budgets are so that they're not really you know incentives aren't a thing for us and unions really aren't a thing for us. We we've built our community and our market so that we can work without those distractions, right. without anything going on like that. Um, if you were to ask me something like, should you join an organization bigger than you, and should you be a part of something else to to help your situation out? Yes, one hundred percent, you should do that. Um, if I'm specifically living in the Tampa area, what sort of organizations or community um, uh, community events should I be attending or looking out for month to month? So are you in, you're, you're, you want to be a commercial? Yeah, I'll say just say. advertising in general. The American Advertising Federation, uh, Tampa Bay, add to mm -hmm. Tampa Bay, which is the younger, uh, I mentioned that earlier. And then um, the American Marketing Association, uh, you you will find to those those three organizations to be very beneficial, very uh, uh, friendly to uh, new people and to hungry people, and they want help. Um, and if those three aren't your cup of tea, there's always an organization out there. Uh, I think you know there's film there's film commissions, there's not film commissions, but there's like film organizations out there too. Yeah. I think Joe Davidson started one, right? Like uh, yeah, Tampa Bay Film Network. There's Women in Film. There's mm -hmm. Film Bar Monday. Women in Film. If you're yeah. of age. Mm -hmm. um, right. So you just got to find it. You just got to Google yeah. and reach out, and don't be afraid to reach out. So let's. Uh, we need to start wrapping up. Here. That's actually a record. Oh, go ahead. It's recommended to work with us. You have to be a part of an organization. To be uh, within our circle of, of, of people that we work with, you, you really have to be a part of the American Air or some sort of organization that you have to give back to. Uh, you, have to you have to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah, and I, I think it's also, you know, you mentioned um, the alumni of Tampa Digital and how you still try to get together, you mm -hmm. try to maintain relationships. Don't burn um, your bridges, man. Ever, ever burn your Don't bridges. Burn your bridges. I, I, unless it's absolutely necessary for a good reason. Right. But typically like right there's now. not, yeah. <laughs> 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 Mike is never going to talk to me again. <laughs> um, 
I, I try to mention this almost every episode, but the film industry is very small, and you start segmenting that more to direct response or commercial or whatever it might be that you're really passionate or good about, that's fewer and fewer people, and all of a sudden you're looking at the Bay Area, um, and I'm just talking about Tampa Bay in general right now, there's about 5,000 total people in this area working in film and digital media, and that could also include okay. web design and everything else. Okay. That's really small. You're talking mm -hmm. about you know a few million people mm -hmm. in this region. Mm -hmm. um, 5,000 people is nothing. So how important is it to maintain relationships, and then how do you, Mike Compton, maintain those relationships? Do you check in with people constantly? I mean, what are some good tips to, to network? That's it. Get out and network. Um, go to the Women in Film Television and Film Commission Christmas party that I'm going to. Go to those things and uh, and meet everybody. And if you somebody you don't know, talk to them. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if it's somebody you do know, shake their hand, say, "Hey, how are how are things? How can I help? Um, how are things going? You know, like just see what see what's on their radar and, and be, you know, legitimately like wanting to know and wanting to learn about them. Don't be like, "Hey." Here, yeah, you know, I'm here. Yeah, I'm gonna go sit in the corner, and not talk to anybody. You gotta talk to people. You gotta talk about what you're passionate about, and don't be afraid to, you know, talk about it. And don't be afraid to look stupid either. Like you can fail, fail, yeah, fail, fail hard, fail fast. But it, it, I mean, you're in everything, agree. Right? Failing is is always important if you learn from the experience. Exactly. Um, but if you walk into a situation knowing you're probably gonna fail, is that a mm. healthy environment? Like, would you ever take a bid? Mm. No, 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 no. Not confident you could do it. Uh, right, right, right. You know, what, what we do and what we constantly are doing with bids is going into it and saying, this is what we can do for you. Right. Take it or leave it, you know. But legitimately, this is what, you know, we'll, again, we'll walk through line item by line item, you know. Production makes 20%, whatever the case may be. If we have to work with that, we'll work with that, as long as you're going to be a returning client and you know we're going right. to tell great stories together. Um, we'll, this is what we can do. Uh, not like, yes, give me your money, and <laughs> we'll do our best to figure right. it out. <laughs> it maybe you'll have something, maybe you won't at the end right, of the day. Right, right, right. No, we don't, we don't do that, yeah. So, yeah, pick yourself up. If you do fail, pick yourself up and do it again. Right. You know, so. Calculated fails, I guess. Right? A few final moments here. Um, uh, another question I like to ask my guests. If you were to look back and talk to 17-year-old Mike Compton, mm. um, what are some life advice? And it doesn't even have to be about the film industry. What are some priorities that you would have tried to communicate to your younger self? Sell. Sell yourself. Uh, be confident. Uh, again, fail. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to look, you know, whatever stupid it is. Yeah. You know, just Get it done. Um, keep working. Keep working hard. Keep your eye on the prize, and uh, mostly just be true to yourself and uh, treat people like you want to be, you know, like you want to be treated. Yeah. yeah. So, um, if someone wants to to talk to you, maybe about Joel Production School mm -hmm. or Three Chairs Media mm -hmm. uh, or some of your other uh, ventures like All Set Supplies, mm -hmm. um, where can they find you? Mike at Three Chairs Productions dot com. It's three spelled out. Chairs plural. Productions plural. Uh, Facebook, Mike Compton 2, Roman numeral 2, I'm a junior. Um, uh, Instagram, yep, Compton City G's on Instagram. I'm very thug. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and then just uh, threecharisproductions.com. Okay. You know. and, uh, and final question, Mike, before uh, we have to say goodbye. Um, you have two twins. 20 years from now, that's going to fly by. Yeah. Are, are you, would you hope oh. that they follow in your footsteps and, and go into film and digital media? Is it something that you think is still going to be relevant or more relevant in the future? It's always going to be. Video and storytelling is always going to be relevant. It's been relevant for millions of years, yeah. right? I mean, cavemen, right? So storytelling and, and, and documenting and that type of thing is always going to be relevant, no matter what the media is, no matter what the technology takes us. AI, crazy, you know, you know. Augmented reality is insane. You know, it's always going to get right. more and more. But there's always going to be a, a story at the end of the day, and there's always going to be a takeaway that you want a feeling that you want to give somebody. Um, and that's kind of why I started, and that's why I'm still in the business. Is just to kind of tell that story and give that feeling to the yeah. mass audiences. Right. Well, yeah. with that, it's time to uh, to wrap things up and say goodbye. Cool. Thank you, Mike, for coming out. I really appreciate it. I'm your host, Tyler Martinolich, Film Commissioner for Hillsborough County, and this has been another episode of Jolt TV. Thank you.